being a designer and having a fashion brand, there's kind of the glamour and the prestige that comes with it and blah, 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 and all that stuff. That is not true, by the way. <laughs> it's just like a front. <laughs> all the designers that I know, they're so exhausted all the time that, yeah, that glamour and prestige is not, uh, it's fake. <laughs> it's not like real. Welcome to the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenda. Today on this series, we have Noor Hajj, who is an award-winning British Lebanese artist and designer working across textile and digital. Her practice is centered on the exploration of West Asian identities, culture, history, and storytelling with a particular focus on the role of women, the supernatural, and mental well-being. Noor, welcome to Africa. Hi, so nice to be here. How's it going? Yeah, good, good. So I'm in Dubai now, so it's extremely hot, but besides that, everything's yeah. good. For a little background, you and I know each other. We're actually, um, so this gives me license to ask you stupid questions because <laughs> I feel like I can ask questions that maybe somebody who isn't as a friendly of a, a face won't permit me to ask. So I need to ask you just like the most basic question, Go ahead. which is what does it mean to be an artist and a designer working across textile and digital? That's a sentence I would never configure in that way. I don't know what that means. Yeah. And so I'm so curious, what does it mean? What does it mean to work across textile and digital? So thing is, because I have, I have a lot of physical textiles and I'm very interested in digital art and how I can uh, bring in the physical textiles into a digital form. So yeah. um, for me, like the, the digital art that I create is more something that I like to do just for fun. Um, as a side thing, as uh, kind of an experimental. So yeah, it's just, um, it's a, you can explore very, it's like two very different worlds. So you can kind of like play around with things on the digital aspect that you couldn't do on the physical aspect um, and vice versa. So is yeah. it, is it literally because is part of it because of you can like press undo, you can press control Z and be like, all right, I can be more playful. Does it allow you to be more playful and experimental um, so when the, you work digitally? So the undo, um, like the undo button, um, yeah, is just makes easier to play around with things because if something doesn't work out, oh, I'll just go back and you know try another thing or just a, a copy of it and play around with that copy. And if it doesn't work out, I'll go back to it. So. Um, in that sense, making mistakes and then fixing them or playing around is just much easier and much quicker. Uh, whereas in like physical, with physical textiles, if you make a mistake, then you kind of either have to go along with it or just start all over again. It just takes much more time. Um, yeah. So there's that aspect, but there's also the idea of like, so... My digital art, the, the, the digital art that I create is um, usually uh, lives on in terms of like NFTs, Web3 and all of that. So there are certain technicalities that I can use and play around with that I wouldn't be able to, uh, to do in a physical, in a physical form. Okay. I want to come back to NFTs and sort of Web3 stuff because also I have so many Stupid question. <laughs> That's there. Um, let's do some biographical stuff. So, um, 15 year old Noor, where does she live and what does she think she wants to do? Oh my God, 15 year old Noor. Poor thing. Um, well, when I was 15, I was in Beirut. I was in a very French Catholic school um, mm. that really did not give any support in terms of any artistic or creative uh, form, careers, whatever it is. Um, I was struggling a lot. Like I was, yeah. I felt kind of isolated. I felt kind of uh, misunderstood. I mean, all teenagers feel misunderstood. Uh, but for me, yeah. it's like the career path that I was choosing at that point really did not fit what um, teachers or people at the school were expecting of me. But it was also some of my classmates were kind of, um, weren't very supportive. So I was told several times, like when I said, oh, I want to, I want to go into design. Like I want to go to a school in Europe and study design. I, 
I had a couple of friends tell me, well, if you study a bit more now, you can get into something, you know, much more fulfilling, like engineer or architect or, uh, but not like fashion design. Like that wasn't something that, you know, people pursued or dreamt of or, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it was pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you think I want to do fashion design because that feels a little more stable than being uh, being an artist? Or were you, do you feel like there are two different parts of your brain and there are two different passions um, and they kind of exist separately? So that's like a more complex thing to answer because at that point, yeah. when I was when I was still at school, being an artist was just not... It wasn't a career path. Like it wasn't, you don't, you don't study to become an artist. Like, um, so design was more, so I never thought about it. So for me, design was more, oh, there's actually like, I can get a job in this. I yeah. can have a salary. I can, you know, all of that. Whereas an artist in my head, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to be in a studio and paint. And then, uh, you know, like a starving artist and maybe someday sell something, um, so yeah, it wasn't, I never thought about it. I never thought like, oh, I could become an artist. So that's why the kind of becoming a designer was what I had in mind. And it wasn't fashion design at the time. Like I was interested in fashion, but I wasn't, I loved making clothes. I loved uh, constructing things. I loved textiles and all of that. But I don't, I don't come from a background where like, I was never exposed to designer clothing or luxury or any of that. I, um, I didn't care about models, still don't care about models, don't care about the fashion industry whatsoever. The so I said, I mean, just go and study design and see what happens. And, um, it was just in, during my first year at university. So the first year is just basically, they teach a bit about all the different, uh, design uh, specializations that they have at the university and a bit of, uh, fine arts. And so during that year, the, the call foundation year, I, you know, by elimination, I was like, okay, I don't, I don't care about product design. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. Ended up uh, choosing fashion design. At, at one point, I was kind of hesitating. Should I go into fine arts or fashion design? And again, kind of like the, the same thought process that I had when I was at school. I was like, no, no, you have to go into fashion design. And yeah, that's how it happened. Yeah. Um, okay. So this podcast I told you beforehand is all about process. Um, this is like part of our outline series. And I'm, I'm curious about the process behind your pieces and, and your work and your practice more broadly. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions about that specifically. And the idea is to kind of focus on, on your art practice, but there'll be obviously questions about how your experience as a designer and working in fashion, how it informs it. So if you were to describe um, the the time in your life where you kind of started to take your uh, interest in art, your art practice more seriously, um, what was that time like? Like what was actually going through your head? Were you inspired by any other, any other people in the field or did it sort of sneak up on you? Oh, um, and it's, it's kind of a long progressive thing. Yeah. So the thing is, I, I really have to credit my, my partner, my husband for really encouraging me into doing this because he, he's a few years just constantly telling me, you're not a designer, you're an artist. Like you work as an artist, you don't work as a designer. And it used to really piss me off so much that he used to say that because in my head, I'm like, no, I'm a designer. Like I am, I have a fashion brand and I, you know, I help, I sell, I do fashion week and I sell in wholesale and you can't say that to me and blah, 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 and all that stuff. Um, but what he meant is that the way I think about, the, the way I process my creativity and the way I think about things and the way I look at things is much more like an artist than a designer. So a designer is you have a specific need that you, um, that you to fulfill. So the co customer or the consumer has a specific need and you design towards that need in a way. So you have to answer to kind of like market um, 
get what what markets want, want what what consumer consumers want, all of that. As an artist, it's much more of a this is something that's inside of me that needs to come out that I need to that I need to express in a way. Um, so th- I think that's in hindsight that's what that's what he meant. That's what I think he meant. So having him constantly telling me that, and me just getting while I was in London just progressively getting more and more tired of the fashion industry and me realizing more and more that oh this is not this is not an industry I want to be part of I don't feel like I belong here and I don't I don't agree with its values and its principles and all of that and at the same time I was doing all of this research every time I designed a collection do all of this an extensive research um, and only maybe like five or ten percent of it would see the light of day with them. It's just it's just the way designing collections work. Like you just don't in fashion, you don't you don't show everything that's behind the scenes and all the work that's done that's been done. Yeah. And I started thinking, okay, maybe I should uh, play around with art pieces just because I have all this research that I really want to explore and really want to show and really want to share with people. How can I do this? And my first um, idea was like, okay, maybe I can, I can express it in an art piece. So that's where that's where it all started. At the same time, um, uh, this person that I knew that later on became a friend of mine, he was also a fashion designer, and he was he all of a sudden just all of a sudden, but like also progressively shifted from being a fashion designer to an artist. So I saw that, and I'm. Oh, wow. You can actually do that. You can actually shift. Like in my head, it was like, no, you're a designer, you're a designer, you're not an artist. Uh, so seeing that and going through everything, uh, I just start, like, it's just, um, I don't know how to explain it. It's little, yeah. little increments in my brain that were happening. Yeah. And then. So I have all these questions. Yeah. So before you keep on going, I have all these questions. One question is, do you think there are a lot of other designers masquerading as artists? And do you think there are a lot of artists masquerading as designers? Listen, I think there's probably being, if if you're an artist, it's much more difficult being a designer than if you're a designer and being an artist. Because I think being a designer, you need a very strong business, business mind, which... Yeah. I haven't met a lot of artists that have that. Um, I mean, of course, you have like, you know, the big names like Jeff Koons and and and, and Damien Hirst. Sure. Like, obviously, they have a business mind because you wouldn't get to that level if you don't, or um, to that scale of production if you don't. But um, what I wanted to say is that there are a lot of designers that also make art pieces. So you have, yeah. Uh, people like um, Hussein um, uh, Shalam, Shalaman, Shalaman, keep on forgetting his last name. He's Turkish Cypriot. Yeah. And uh, he's been around for a few decades. And he's a proper designer that still, I, I, know, I don't know if he still has a line that's running, but he also has art pieces in museums. And, and he used to do his fashion shows in a very kind of, like an art, art performance in a way. And the, yeah. also the, the subjects that the themes of his collections were very, like they 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 were more like similar to art pieces themes of art pieces than to actual fashion collections and he's one of the designers that he used to be one of my favorite designers as a student so it kind of tells you where my mind was even at that time yeah so in in your mind going back to um your husband Nasri um and that line, right? Saying like, you're, come on, you're, you're not a designer and you getting, you getting frustrated by that. I, I think part of your frustration is an assumption that there's an implication that, that being a designer is less than being an artist, right? And my head is being an artist is less than being a designer. Oh, okay. So interesting. Interesting. So I heard it differently. I heard it like you were like, Hey, listen, stop. Um, being a designer is awesome. Stop telling me that it's that I I'm not a I'm not a designer. Yeah. Do you think that do you now see them on equal footing 
and not even understand that sort of acknowledge this plane as existence period? So I, I see them as equal footing, but for me yeah. personally, personally, being an artist yeah. is more than being a designer. Um, mm. Because when you're a designer, you have kind of a structure that you follow and you need to follow it. And it's something that you do at least twice a year. And, you, and if you follow it more or less, it's going to work out. An artist is a much more difficult path. Um, and, you know, you spend a lot of time by yourself, whereas designer, you have teams that you work with and all of that. But at the time, you know, because I think I was still in that mindset that I, that I had when I was a teenager, where it was, you know, it's, and there's some sort of kind of belittling of, of, of artists that can, the environment that I was in, it was like, oh, artist is just something that you do on the side or yet you don't like, it's not a career path. It's not something that you, um, you dream of achieving or whatever it is. So I think I was still in that kind of mindset. Whereas like being a designer and having a fashion brand, there's kind of the glamour and the prestige that comes with it and blah, 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 and all that stuff. That is not true, by the way. <laughs> it was just like a front. <laughs> All the designers that I know hate hate their lives, but like they're so exhausted all the time that yeah, um, that glamour and prestige is not uh, it's a uh, it's fake. <laughs> it's not like real. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about something else you said earlier. Um, you said that part of your job as a designer was to kind of hide the work. A little bit, right? So you had so much, you had done so much research, and then you could only really show a few, a small percentage of it. I, 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 based off what you said, I think what you meant was that like so much of the work was actually like hidden in plain sight, but you couldn't really like explore it. What is that research? What was that research? Because I feel like it's related. Your art showcases that research, and your art actually like explores it in a in a more uh, transparent way. Um, what is that research? Like, help me understand what research you would have done or you are doing. Um, at that time I was, so I, when I moved to London, I decided to, cause I started my brand in, in, in Beirut. And then two, three, a few years later, I, I moved to London. We moved to London. And so when I moved to London, um, I decided to shift into menswear, which is, mm -hmm. uh, I, pre I always preferred to design for men more than for women. Just came more naturally to me. And it's something that I trained to do when I was in Paris working for uh, a designer. So, um, so when I shifted to menswear, I really wanted to focus on kind of reimagining traditional menswear from the Middle East into something that would be more, I, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. Like kind of more of a, that would fit more European life, more European cities. So I was doing an like, extensive research, um, not only into cuts and the fabrics and all of that that are used in um, traditional menswear from the Middle East, but also why were these pieces designed in that way and cut in that way? So to give you an example, like the mm. Abaya, the abaya that we we wear um, in the in the Levant in Bilad al-Sham. So it's cut in that way and it has that volume, first of all, because it's the easiest way to make it. But mm -hmm. it was also used um, not only as something to to wear, to keep warm on top of your clothes and all of that, but also like if if you're a shepherd and you're out um you know, with the animals and all of that, and it starts raining, they used to use it as, you know, cover from the rain. Uh, they used to sleep under it as a tent. Uh, they used to use it to carry goods as well, uh, things like that. So it was more also looking into why these things were designed in that way because of, you know, um, da daily life or because of cultural practices. And so yeah. really getting into kind of like, Middle Eastern culture and and what it means yeah. to be, you know, um, 
from, you know, from Lebanon, from Syria, from Palestine. And then I started kind of like slowly extending to um, other countries. So the, the Abaye you're talking about is the one that's open from the front that's sort of in with a Western eye would look like just a robe, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the earlier projects in your art practice. How did you approach them? What were what were they? Ex what were these things inside you that you're like, I just need to get this out? Um, so the earliest, the first, do you want me to talk about the first, first one or like the, the Sure. So the first one that kind of really got in, got, got me into my art practice is, um, yeah. and a piece that, uh, was commissioned by the Arab British Center in London. So the mm -hmm. Arab British Center wanted to put together an exhibition, a group exhibition with four women artists from the Arab world in a small, museum in London called Dr. Johnson House. And it's all around um, how the Muslim world um, impacted English society starting um, the 16th century, so like the, the 1500s uh, till the 1800s. So like the first impact, the first contact they had with each other, how the Muslim world impacted um, English society in England. So that was the theme of it. And I really got it, got into kind of like researching uh, Elizabethan society at the time. So, and, and because she was the first one that started trade alliances with the Ottoman Empire and the Moroccan Kingdom at the time. So England would, you know, trade with uh, wool and gunpowder and uh, in exchange for spices and sugar and uh, and dyes and things like that from the Ottoman Empire and the Moroccan Kingdom. And when, b before they started these trade alliances, you can kind of see, and it's recorded that England was kind of an impoverished state. Uh, and throughout uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, life, you can see how the society started getting wealthier and wealthier just by like how big their neck ruffles would get. Um, and yeah, the portrait. And so it's really, there is that like funny thing from like, you just like tell from the portrait, but also it's like that connection, like they were part of why they were able to get to enrich themselves is from these trade alliances. And that got me to like, look at the Silk Roads and how these spices got into the Ottoman Empire through the Silk Roads. So that was the theme of the first uh, piece. And that's when I was like, okay, I can connect what I was, what I'm doing as a designer to my art practice. Cause it's kind of in the same world, uh, but yeah. what really happened, like at that show, uh, there was a curator from the VNA that came at the opening and she saw the piece and she absolutely loved it. And, uh, we started talking and she ended up offering me a research fellowship at the VNA museum. And that's where, during my time uh, at that uh, fellowship, that's when I really got interested in, uh, yeah, what I what I call now my obsession, which is all sorts of um, divine and 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 supernatural protections against uh, illnesses and the evil eye and all of that, uh, specifically in West Asian uh, uh, cultures. So yeah, it's like it's like the that piece was a starting point that propelled me into what is now the main uh core or focus of my practice. Okay, so let's talk about that main core and focus. Why are you so obsessed with <laughs> I mean that's like the obvious the obvious question. And no, what is at the what is at the what is at the core of your obsession? What what do you hope to find on the other side of this tunnel, Noor? I want to understand why. So not why, like scientifically why, but I want to understand from people why. Why these? Why these colors? Why these designs? Why these elements? And it's it's interesting because when I when I started the research at the VNA, I had no idea I was gonna end up there. So I just started looking at objects, I started looking at a lot of um 
Palestinian embroidery, costumes, uh, like ancient Egyptian textiles. Like I held in my hand a 5,000 year old textile from Egypt. So I really kind of widened the net. I tried to look at, at things as much as possible. And then I was going through um, this really amazing book by Widat Kawar, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. 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 Widat yeah. Jordan. Exactly. And she, yeah. you know, she's one of the biggest, um, I want to call her archivist because she's, she has a big archive of Palestinian embroidery. Yeah. But this specific book called Threads of Identity is one of the best books about Palestinian embroidery that I have ever read because she went and she interviewed women um, that embroider uh, and not only kind of asking them about the embroidery, but um, asking them about like they 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 shared about their experiences when you know before the Nakba and after the Nakba and what happened and how that um, impacted what they would embroider and how they would embroider and all of that. So it's really it's also about oral history, and there is just like these two pages, not even like a double page um, of photos of amulets. There's a few pages of photos of amulet. So an amulet is basically, it could be anything. It could be like a pendant. It could be a bracelet. It could be something that you, it's something that you carry with you that is supposed to hold a talismanic power. So it's supposed to protect you against something or supposed to bring something good to you. Or um, So it's, it could either be religious. So it could either hold some sort of uh, Quranic or... Um, biblical re references like like scripture um yeah. or it could be a blue stone like a blue stone is considered an amulet mm. so she had a few pages of talking about these amulets but there was like one double page about these specific bracelets and little amulets that are all different types of beads it doesn't look like anything i've ever seen come out uh from like western asia like it, it doesn't doesn't look like anything else I've seen, basically. Yeah. And, and the, the idea is that these amulets, um, you know, they're, they're made out of beads, coins, uh, little animal bones, uh, seashells, things like that. And they're made, they're usually put together by women, and they're given from woman to daughter to granddaughter. So it's like a matrilineal transition. Mm. And the reason why they don't look like anything I've ever seen is because they're a mix of all sorts of things. So these women would either find these random things in the fields or buy them in stores and put them together. And you see like a mix of Phoenician beads with Ottoman coins, with Austrian coins, with, uh, I don't know, like Roman beads or coins and things like that. And for me, it, and besides the fact that they, they're believed to have protective elements. They also show kind of the history of this land. So all the empires and cultures that have been that have gone through it and have left their traces in this land. And they're all kind of like in one little tiny piece of jewelry. Yeah. And I just, I thought that was like the most fascinating thing I've ever read. And that kind of was the starting point of me going into it. Yeah. So... How is that related to some of the, the, the sort of iconic images that we think of when we think of, you know, like you, you mentioned evil eye and you mentioned stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, how are those things related? Are they where they have been represented on these objects or? So sometimes, sometimes the evil yeah. eye is, is a very interesting, um, very interesting thing because people, like it's a, wide geographical um area that believes in 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 the evil eye and so you have you know a big chunk of um eastern mediterranean to egypt you have the balkans you have them in central asia as well so i think a lot of it was spread during the ottoman empire uh, but the idea yeah. is that nobody knows where originally it comes from so you have different theories because it's so old that there is no written record of how like why when it started but it, what's interesting about it is that it's something 
that obviously comes that dates it's pre-religion, right? Um, yeah. But it didn't stop when you know Christianity and Islam and uh, I mean Jude, I don't I don't know if it, date, it dates uh, it's pre-Judaism, but it definitely uh, predates uh, Christianity and, and Islam. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, like Islam and Christianity adopted it. So when you look at um, let's say like the Virgin Mary in, in in Lebanon, most of the time she's wearing like a blue cloak. Which is not something mm. that you see very often in in, in European uh, churches and and in the U.S. Um, so, so you just like the religions adopted it instead of kind of like putting an end to it. So for me, it's yeah, yeah, it's like an interesting thing because it kind of transcended that. It slid in. <laughs> it's what I mean the cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it slid in. And also, yeah. it's like, it's not only that, I mean, um, the the people who managed and made these types of decisions were pragmatists, right? And so they were like, all right, we're going to incorporate this previous, this custom or this previous ritual that's like hugely popular. We're going to, you know, we're going to make it that day. Like we're going to make uh, Christmas on December 25th because there's already a really interesting ritual happening on December 25th. And let's not like uh, put ourselves behind the eight ball. Let's make some things like easier as yeah. a cell, you know? Yeah. So it's like, all right, evil eye is like super popular. <laughs> let's throw it in there. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, yeah. Well, the interesting bit for me is that uh, when I was doing that research, um, I came to realize that, because in my head, I'm like, oh, it's only the evil eye. And then it come, I came to realize it's actually the evil eye is, okay, it's, it's, it's like widely believed in um, geographically, but it's not the, like, there's so many things that we do culturally as practices, mm. the way we speak, the way we... Um, you know, fumigate our homes, things like that. Those are all, like we do all of these as protective elements. And that's what I, that's where the obsession started. I'm like, oh, I grew up with all of this. I grew up doing all of that, not knowing why. <laughs> now I'm like, now I want to know why. And so, it, and what happens is that when I create an, an art piece and I, you know, I, there's an exhibition opening or whatever, and I'm talking to people about it, people start sharing uh, their own beliefs, uh, even if they're from a different culture. And and that's the best bit of it. And that's, I think, why I do it is because I want to I wanna hear these stories. I want to know yeah. the backgrounds, I, you know? So, okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot because I'm, uh, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. What are some of them, can you just like walk me through a few of them? Like, like burning sage, you said fumigating your home, right? Like, what are some of them that you're like, you became obsessed with and you sort of saw all the way through to the end, be like, oh, I really understand where this came from and can kind of tell the story. So you have, for instance, like fumigation. So depending on what you're fumigating, uh, some, some things that they burn are uh, thinking that, oh, this is to kind of clear out bad energy and to protect us can actually have, uh, they can actually uh, clean out the air around you in a way mm -hmm. uh, yeah. or keep pests away or, keep, you know, so there yeah. is that link between them. I mean, I'm not saying everything that you burn <laughs> will do that, yeah. but there are certain <laughs> things. Um, but even if it's just the smell, Right, because sometimes when there's a bad smell, psychologically, you start feeling yeah. ill, you get nauseous and all of that, and they just like spiral, you spiral into it. Burning something will psychologically change that um, chain reaction in your head because it'll, you're changing yeah. the smell of it. What do, like, what are, I mean, I mentioned sage. What else do people burn? Sage, I like, think. Like, what do people do? Sage is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is a North American thing. So yeah, yeah. Um, you have sure. bay leaves. People burn bay leaves. Uh, people mm. burn um, chickpeas, dried chickpeas. So I saw during my research, I went to this museum in uh, 
in England, in Oxford, mm. called the Pitt Rivers Museum. And they had this big wall hanging. Again, I've never seen a piece like that. It's uh, originally from Syria. I think it could be Kurdish. I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. And it's all like strings of uh, chickpeas, dried chickpeas. And um, the idea is that you have it hanging on the wall or you have it um, hanging in a doorway. And then every now and then you would take away a, a, a chickpea and burn it um so you have that <laughs> yeah i don't know what it would smell like no idea yeah so this is not this is not like bukhur as we typically so you have like have. uh fr fr frank what's it called frank frankincense, frankincense. Uh, yeah bakhur, uh, oud as well um yeah. nogs so you know what you use yeah. in, in in cooking that is that's also burnt and that's also actually worn as an, as necklaces um. Uh, yeah, there's there's a few. Super interesting. So let's go through another sort of project that you would work on. Like, what are you working on right now? What are some of the things that you're obsessed with right now? So I just I just uh finished I just finished a few months ago. It's a commission in London for a museum called the Leighton House. So it opened end of April and it's still running till mid July. I don't know when this is coming yeah. out. So, uh, um, yeah. yeah, it'll be out soon. Okay, yeah. cool. So it's running till the 16th of July. And yeah. basically, it's again the Arbor Center that um, commissioned me to research the Leighton House Museum and to create art pieces out of it. Now, the Leighton House is for people that don't know it, it's in the historical house. In London. Yeah, that's the picture from it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was built by this guy called uh, Lord Leighton. He used to be a lord. He used to be a painter, quite successful painter in his time. And he had a growing obsession with the Muslim world. And he used to travel mm -hmm. to Syria quite a lot, to Turkey, uh, I think to, I can't remember which countries but in, in Northern Africa. And he used to collect tiles and mosaics. And at some point, he had such a massive collection that he decided to build an extension to his house just to display the, um, the collection. And so you, now you have this big room that's called the Arab Hall at Leighton House. And it, basically, it's supposed to look like, um, you know, and, and one of those rooms in North Africa or in Syria. It's all like multi blue and gold. But it's, I mean, mm. the architect was also inspired by um, a palazzo in, in Italy. So it's like a mishmash of different things. And uh, yeah, the commission was to research the interior of it and the, the, te the textile collection and create art pieces out of it. So I was reading this article that you had sent me earlier, and it talked about these inscriptions and, um, and how that sort of played into it. Did you know that those inscriptions existed? Did you know this sort of backstory? No. So when, when I was looking at the interior of the house, I realized that all the, there's like series of inscriptions. All of them are either Quranic verses or um, verses from, from, from poems and things like that. Most of them, if not all of them, have, are, have these protective elements. So they ask God to protect this house or... Um, mm. Yeah, all sorts uh, these type of things. And then I was like specifically drawn to this series of panels and I wanted to kind of know what it says and all that. So they sent me a document, um, um, you know, detailing all the, basically the inscriptions, what they are, because it's almost impossible to read them. Like, I, I don't know how to read calligraphy, especially when they're on yeah. tiles. And it turns out this uh, series of tiles is um, originally from, the inscription of it is uh, from a poem that's written by a prominent sheikh from, from um, Jizin, which is in the south of Lebanon, which is a mm. uh, region that I'm from originally. And it is the only series uh, of tiles in the whole museum that has any link to Lebanon. And so for me, the coincidence was just too much. <laughs> I needed to delve into it. And um, 
talking to... And we should, we should mention that this is not a sheikh that's like writing in 1970. No. This is like a sheikh. Yeah. The 1300s. Yeah. 1300s, uh, Lebanon. So, yeah. And it was, it was initially seen in, in inscribed uh, inside the whole, uh, inside his home in Jassin. Uh, okay. And then later on made into tiles. So uh, the museum didn't know anything about this sheikh. And I really wanted to research him. Honestly, it was quite easy. I just researched his name in Arabic and read his Wikipedia in Arabic. And You um, called like Ibn Ammak and uh, okay. you said... <laughs> Actually, my dad. <laughs> I'm like, dad, can you go find this house in Jazin? He's like, no, it doesn't exist. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> anymore. Uh, but yeah, so... Basically, yeah, I did some research on this guy. Turns out he was quite prominent and then he was um, assassinated uh, later on, like imprisoned and then assassinated. Uh, and what I really wanted to do, because I saw how little the museum knew about this, um, this mm. man and where these in inscriptions came from. And I wanted to link the soil, the land where they originally come from to the museum. So what I ended up doing is I collect, back in December, I collected a bunch of uh, samat berries. So samat, the, the spice that we use, um, grows, uh, uh, grows as berries on trees. And then, you know, we yeah. cut them, we, we dry them, and they're originally like an ochre color, like a yellowish color. And once they're dried in the sun, they become this reddish color. They like get roasted in the sun, basically. Exactly. And so yeah. I gathered a bunch of those and... Um, dyed the fabrics with these berries and all the fabrics that I've used um, in this exhibition are fabrics that are dyed with the berries. So somehow bringing that land, that soil to, uh, to the museum. How, how is a piece like this received? Oh, and do you care how it's received? I mean, yeah. Talk to me what so that feels like. For me, when I'm working on it, I, when I was working on it, I didn't care. Like, I didn't think about how people are going to receive it. Because for me, it's like, this is something important that I need to do. Um, and there's a piece mm -hmm. of where I'm from that's in this museum. And I want to highlight where it's from. And I want to highlight this piece. And I want to show people. I want to bring importance to where it's from. And that was, that was why I did this. But the thing is, like, when you look at these pieces, you have no idea that these are dyed with samat because samat has its reddish color, and these pieces are golden yellow, and um, <laughs> and and lilac, like lilac, lilac uh, gray. I don't know what you would call that color. Yeah. Um, but as soon as people read about the pieces, and as soon as or I when I talk about them, um, there's like that instant, like. You know, I don't know what, like that moment where people go like, yeah. oh, wow. Like, you know, so in all in all, it was really well received. But while working on them, it's it wasn't something that I was thinking. About. Yeah. It's funny because like as you're, is your designer brain uh, switching on during this process at all? Are you, do you become like very pragmatic? Like, okay, this is a problem worth solving. I need to figure out how to solve it. <laughs> and like, is that, does that part of you turn on at all? Or is it a deeply like emotive, like, um, um, uh, search, internal search for what is inside you and what you have to say? And I mean, like, well, or both. It's both. So there is something like an internal thing that, that's pushing you is like, you need to do this. This needs to happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the designer bit comes in when I'm trying to like, like, I, like I, so being a designer is you're constantly thinking about perfection and you're like planning. Yeah. I'm like, this is how it's Work supposed slow. to look. Yeah. And yeah. Um, as an artist, you usually don't work in that way. Uh, but for me, it's like a constant battle where yeah. the designer bit is like, this needs to look in this way. And if it doesn't look that way, it means it's bad. And I'm constantly trying to like, you know, the other part of my brain being like, no, it's okay. Like it doesn't need to be perfect. So it's like, um, it's like a balance. Yeah. 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 It's, it's super interesting. So, um, going back all the way uh, to the first thing you said, the beginning of the, when you're talking about digital, uh, mm -hmm. and 
and NFTs. How would that interact? How would that work and that interest and that part of your practice interact with something like this, if at all? So it's different. Like when I, I think it, and yeah. I, I might have said it in the beginning. Yeah. I see them as connected, but separate. Uh, what I like to explore in my digital work is, um, is more playful, much more. It's literally, I just play around with things. Would so, it, but would it be attacking the same, or not attacking, exploring the same question? Could it possibly be exploring the same question? It could. About who this guy was and what that world was like in the, thir in the 14th century and, you know, how this arrived there and how this inscription showed up on these tiles in this place in the UK? It could. Um, yeah. It's just I didn't do it. Yeah. Didn't yeah. Create it, an in this, in this, in this case, you didn't do it. Yeah. Um, but what I try, yeah. what I like to do in my digital work is really yeah. recreate something that doesn't look real. So mm. the f first of all, all the fabrics, all, all my digital work is based on existing physical fabrics. So I photograph them and manipulate them digitally. So they, they exist in a digital form that the, in which they don't exist in the, in the physical form, if that makes sense. Yeah. So either in terms of color, texture, uh, pattern repeat, uh, animation, um, yeah, things like that. And it's usually the digital pieces are pieces that are much more personal. So uh, there's a series that I did, there are self-portraits that's around uh, my mental health. It's when I had um, COVID in 2021 and uh, I was still in London and um, it was a very like difficult time. And I wanted to document and kind of document my mental state during that time and created this series of self-portraits. So that's why I like to leave digital artwork for things that are much more personal. How interesting. I would, you know, like I would imagine that it would be the opposite. It's really interesting that it's in that, you know, <laughs> that Tadkib. Yeah. That, um, it's almost like... Yeah. So I, I don't know why it just happened that way. It's not like I planned it. Like whatever I was creating just became, the more I worked on it, the more it became a, something that was personal, something that I was, you know, like uh, something that I was going through and I wanted to document it, all of that. Yeah. Do you feel pressures to be a specific type of artist? I used to, I don't anymore. Yeah. What did the, what, what kind of artist did you feel like you needed to be? And then you figured out a way to shed that. It's one of the reasons why I was very hesitant into kind of, you know, jumping into the art world. Cause I think art sometimes can be very intimidating, very, like it's not, not very approachable. Um, it's something that I don't like at all. Like I don't like going to an exhibition and not understanding the text that I'm reading. Um, and I thought that this was the only way that you could be an artist is to kind of, be, you know, write things that are so complicated and use words that people don't use and, um, and, you know, like very academic and things like that where, and, and I struggled with it because I am not like this. And that's something that people actually, some people misunderstand about my work because it's very research-based. Some people tend to think I'm quite academic, which I am not at all. I just start in kind of written texts or research and then take that into something um, much more emotional, much more um, something that I reinterpret in a way. So, um, and what I realized as I went along and as I talked to more and more people and as I did kind of uh, looked into the art world much more is that you can be, you don't have to be that way. You know, you can be you can have art that's much more approachable. Um, topic have you know topics of and themes of discussion that are people can engage with much easier, and that's what I like about it because I think I think art should be for I'm not gonna say everybody, but for like 
every, everyone should have a reaction to the art piece. And if you don't understand it at all, you're not going to have any reaction to it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, I mean, it's funny, you were talking about the fashion industry and sort of being a little, the fashion to sort of design industry and feeling a little allergic to it. And as you were talking, I was like, oh my God, if, if you're allergic to that industry, how do you feel about the art industry? Listen, that's the thing. Like when I talk, when I talk to like gallerists and curators uh, about the issues that I have about the fashion industry, and they're like, oh my God, the art world is much worse. I'm like, yes, it can be, but you also have a part of it. Like you have little, you have, um, I want to say like less gatekeepers than you do in fashion, if that makes sense. Wow, really? Yeah. Yeah, the fashion world is like a very, it's, a, yeah, I don't know how, I'm not going to get into it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Do you feel like there are two separate art worlds? The one, because you used to live in London, now you live in Dubai. Um, do you feel like those are two different art worlds when you overlay the idea that like Arab artists between the two, or is it one, are you basically, you just changed where you pay rent, but you're basically in the same place? So, uh, I prefer, it's not I prefer, be I think because I'm Arab and because of the, you know, the themes of my research behind my pieces and all of that is very much in this, in this region. Yeah. It's much easier for me, like the, the way people see my work and understand my work, they understand it much easier here than they do in the UK. And then in the UK, there's, you need extra layers for extra, mm. um, you to explain it more to people. Um, yeah. And people tend to, it's not only in the art world, it's in design and like everywhere in, in the UK. They want to kind of pigeonhole people in, in certain ways and certain kind of like labels. And so you're, if, because I'm originally Arab, my work needs to talk about my Arab identity, which somehow mine does, but it's not specifically about I, my identity. It's more about themes that are in this region. But, um, the, it, like, and that's the, that's the big issue for me in the UK is that it always needs to answer kind of a quota that they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking, you have to be, um, you I'm have to like speak to that. You have to sing that song every single time. Yeah. Uh, but I'm talking about art institutions specifically. So I'm not talking about commercial galleries and art fairs and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the institutions who are like very excited about identity mm -hmm. and just like reinforce the, that idea deeply. Um, Okay, before we wrap up, I want to do our little quick Q&A. Um, but maybe before we do that, are you working on, there's the exhibition coming out in July or that's running until the end of July, but what else are you working on that we should know about? So right now I'm working on a few pieces. I'm building my solo exhibition, actually. Uh, hmm. Hopefully with a gallery here in Dubai. It's not all set in stone yet. So, uh, but yeah. Hopefully it'll be opening early next year. But um, yeah, it's, it's around the same themes, but it's something quite uh, personal to me. And I'm really excited to finish the pieces and to share it with everybody next year. Cool. So what advice would you give to that 15-year-old that you talked about earlier? Uh, don't give up. And... Um, don't listen to anybody. No, no one. Not no one, but like, <laughs> don't listen to those specific people, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny. Um, as you were saying it, um, I think maybe the, the advice that I would give myself, I'm not going to impose this on you, but the advice I would give myself is like, it's not don't listen to anybody, but it's don't listen to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess that's what it is. Uh, yeah. It's a difficult one, right? Because if you, if you're going to give a different advice that, than when you were following when you were 15, you might end up in a, you know, in a much worse situation today. 
You may have become like an accountant or. <laughs> Can you imagine me an accountant? I would be so bad. <laughs> Just putting evil eyes into all your emails to be like, look, I don't know. I, uh, this may help. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Let's, let's wrap up. Let's do the, um, the quick Q and A. So what are you reading or watching these days? Reading. I'm, um, I'm a bit ADD when it comes to reading. So I read sure. several books at the same time. Uh, and they're usually very different than, so I have art books that I, I have like stacks of art books on our coffee table every now and then, like every morning I would pick up, uh, an art book and just like flip through it or read a section of it and then close it. The next day I would read something else. And, but I also have, um, novels that I read and I usually read two at the same time. Um, I'm trying yeah. to get myself into reading Arabic again. So there's, um, this, uh, person that I've called my f a friend here and she always kind of sends me and gives me, uh, books written in Arabic and yeah, so I try to read those and I just finished, um, a book by, uh, Nora Ephron, Heartburn. Yeah. Just not just in fun. Arabic. Not in Arabic. No. <laughs> Um, I love but, Nora Ephron's amazing. What yeah, she's so good. But uh, watching, so I'm really into sci-fi right now. Mm, I've been nice. into sci-fi for a couple of years, specifically feminist sci-fi. But what I'm watching now is two series, uh, Silo and Foundation, that I that that are based on books as well. But yeah, they're I don't really, know really good. Of those. They're so good. They're so good. You should check them out. Awesome. What What are the is it like what version of sci-fi? There's a couple of different subgenres. What kind of sort of version of sci-fi we talking? So my ultimate preferred one, which is not which is not what I'm watching now, is feminist sci-fi. So like The Handmaid's Tale is a feminist sci-fi. Yeah. Um, there was a book that I was reading by a Pakistani writer called Before She Sleeps, which is yeah. also I mean I read that a couple of years ago which is also uh, feminist sci-fi. Um, mm. Yeah, that's my favorite type of stuff. Okay, cool. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? It's nobody famous or nobody uh, work-related. So my grandmother, my mom's mom, uh, passed away. She passed away in 2011. And mm. I feel like I never got to know her that well. I'm very close to my paternal grandmother, like super, super close. She's like a second mom to me. She's shared so much of her life with me. Um, yeah. She was one of the reasons why I got into textiles from the beginning, because she embroiders. She taught me how to do a bunch of things and work with textiles. But my maternal grandmother, I don't know that well, part because, I mean, I know her well, but I don't know anything about her as a person. I know her as my, you know, my teta, not my, yeah. not like who she is as a person. And part of it is because she's always been super quiet. Like she doesn't, she never shared about her life. She doesn't talk about her emotions. She doesn't talk what she's, about what she's going through. And I remember growing up, it's always been kind of like, oh, I wonder what she's thinking about. And even when we're staying with her in, in the village, like she would just go off and do stuff without telling anybody. And then she would come back with things and cook us stuff. And, and I've always wondered what she's thinking and always wondered what her, like when she's going about her day, how is, is she planning it? Is it it's like second, like all of these things, what her life was before. If I had to pick like one person, it would be her just to kind of feel that connection to her and get to know her a bit more. Yeah. It's funny with grandparents, um, the degree to which uh, I and I feel like everyone around me fundamentally misunderstands their grandparents. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is like, as my parents have gotten older and my siblings have had kids, um, I've like gotten to see my nieces and nephews form a deep misunderstanding of my parents. 
Um, <laughs> and because they're not my kids, I'm not protective of them or defensive about it um, or, or like apologetic. Um, but I can, I, I can see them turn my parents into small little icons. Mm. Um, and the nature of icons is that they're small and they have to minimize everything and they have to like iron out all the contours and iron out any of the complexity and just have like really s solid straight lines. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm like seeing that misunderstanding happen in <laughs> real time, like, oh my God, this is crazy. And reflecting back on my own childhood and be like, oh, I must have completely and still to this day, completely misunderstand the nature of my grandparents' personalities and their histories and their stories and how they probably felt about us and me specifically, <laughs> like just because I'm talking about myself. Um, and so I completely relate to that. Uh, I completely relate to that. So desire. my paternal grandmother, she had my dad when she was really young, when she was 17. So already her and my dad were very close yeah. uh, relationship wise. And then we, me and my siblings, um, are very close to her as well because she lived with us, uh, she still lives with us. And so when I became an adult and I started spending time with her as an adult, that's when I started discovering her as a person and who she yeah. is and understanding, you know, the complexities of, you know, her being the person that she is and what she's been through and all of that. And I think with age also, people tend to share more and more about their life and what they regret doing and what they regret not doing and all of that. Uh, where I didn't have that with my maternal grandmother because she passed away also, uh, you know, a while ago. So I didn't get to like understand her as an adult. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. Okay. Um, what do you think people most misunderstand about your work? Oh, I spoke about that earlier. Yeah. Um, I think it's what, yeah, it's like when people think about my work as being academic work. Um, because let me rephrase like, this question then. Mm -hmm. Since you sort of talked about this already, let me change this. What do you think you misunderstand? What do you think you misunderstood about what it meant to be an artist, like a professional person, um, before you fully launched into it? Um, I thought an artist, it's one of the reasons why it took me a while to get into it. I thought an artist was somebody who, um, like a starving artist, like somebody who just did work, had no plan, had no, uh, structure, um, uh, yeah. And I think. It took, a, it took a long time for me to dismantle that, um, uh, that idea. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you're going to become rich, becoming, doing, making art. It's, it's still one of the most difficult career paths to have. I think if you want to have a, um, a stable income, all of that, like that's not something that you should go into, but, uh, <laughs> but I think it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's not as, it's not what I thought it was. Okay. So for the last question, um, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Let's sort of turn it into a list. Is there a list of people who inspire you to do your work? And it can be multi, uh, multidisciplinary inside, outside the Arab world. I'll let you answer it how you want. There's a few, uh, I think some of them are much more, uh, renowned and known than others. So I think I would put as my top favorite um, artist, it would be Ola Farinaisen. So he's um, a Danish Icelander um, artist, if I'm not mistaken. And he his work is extremely different from my work. And I never, I would have never thought to do any work similar to what he does. But it's First of all, the process in which he works with, he works with engineers and architects and um, all sorts of people. Like his studio in Berlin is massive and filled, like his team is really big. And, um, but what I specifically like about his work is um, how, uh, how he works with light, basically. 
whether it's natural light or, or artificial light. And it's really interesting because you see it in all of his installations and his uh, art pieces. Um, then you have one of the earliest um, artists that I was exposed to when I was at university that really inspired me is Mona Hatoum. So she's Palestinian Lebanese artist. And um, it's really funny because I had never heard of her and I was in my art history class. And my teacher, who was, it was what still till today, one of my favorite art history teachers ever. She, I was, I don't know, I wasn't listening during class and I think she got really annoyed and she's like, no, you're writing uh, a paper about uh, this artist. And she told me, and I was like, who is this artist? Like, who is this person you're giving? And I got really annoyed because she gave me, she's like, is she, did she? Give me Mona Hatoum because I'm the only Arab student in this class. Um, and then I researched her and I looked at her work and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing work. Like, this is art for me. This is something that carries a message and is also like visually impactful. Uh, yeah. So I would definitely put Mona Hatoum up there. <laughs> I like the idea. You're like, who is this loser that she... Recommended. One of like, the oh. biggest artists from the Arab world, right? <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, there's also this Chilean art artist and poet called uh, Cecilia Vicuña. I could be pronouncing her last name very badly. So she currently has a um, big installation at the entrance of the Tate Modern in London. And mm. she she's a poet, but she also works with textiles a lot. Um She's, yeah, she's great. I think I look at her work and you can, like, if you see the pieces that I work on, you can probably kind of see a connection there. Not only yeah. because it's textiles, but it has certain kind of like other worldly elements to it. I'm thinking, well, I mean, there's, the list is, is quite long. I'm just trying to kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, if, if it's this to rec, if this is to recommend to people that really want to get into it and really un want to understand, for instance, our art. Yeah. My first recommendation would be, um, listen, uh, or read anything that Sultan al Qasimi writes, because if there's one person that, um, yeah, I think is like a base to where you want to get your information about Arab modern art or Arab contemporary art. It should be him. Absolutely. Um, okay, cool. That's fantastic. Um, so if anyone's interested in finding more information about you, it's very easy to find you online. Noor Haj, N-O-U-R-H-A-G-E. Um, Noor, thanks so much for doing this. It was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.